Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Mandisa Thomas to Esoteric Thoughts channel. Mandisa, please start by telling us who is Mandisa Thomas? Yes, and thank you so much for having me as a guest on your show. For those who aren't familiar with me, I am the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, which is a US-based nonprofit organization that provides community support and advocacy for Blacks who are atheist, humanist, agnostic, as well as questioning the religious beliefs in favor of leaving. Now, I'm a New York City native. I was born and raised, uh, relocated to the Atlanta, Georgia area in 1997 at the end when I was 21 years old, moved down with my family. And I wasn't formally raised religious. Um, I was raised in the black conscious community. I did have some experience with religion as a, as a guest soloist with my voice instructor. And I, uh, my, my background was rooted in, you know, education, always going to the library um, and being involved in various programs. And so I had an exposure to various religions and also forms of mythology growing up. However, I was still very much surrounded by religious family members and friends, as well as, um, you know, the dynamic of religion when it, as it pertains to Black communities in particular. So in moving to Georgia in the Atlanta area, uh, I was repeatedly asked, uh, what church do you go to? It's not even, an, it's not even if you go to church, it's an assumption. <laughs> so, um, and over the years in being able to examine, because I really developed a dislike for the church, uh, Christianity in particular, I, I saw through the hypocrisy and it just never sat well with me. So, uh, but over the years I identified as spiritual but not religious and, and not really realizing at the time that it was just like a, a misnomer or, you know, a non-starter really. It, it didn't really just, it didn't really mean or say anything. <laughs> but um, I connected with uh, folks like Jeremiah Kamara who is also here in the Atlanta area. He's the author of Holy Lockdown, Does the Black Church Limit Progress? And um, he's also the producer of the documentary Contradiction, which is on Amazon Prime. So, uh, and all, and coming across uh, Black atheist communities and also other atheist communities online, I was able to really, um, really resolve my identity uh, about, 12 years ago now. So in trying to find community and trying to find more like-minded individuals, we saw that there was something lacking when it comes, when it came to like diversity, finding other black atheists um, and also the information that was available. And so in the Atlanta area, uh, it was decided to start a local group that helped bring out more Black atheists and other um, similar identities, uh, identified folks, um, to help build community, to increase that visibility for us. Because you know, once you really religion, it can be difficult. It can be difficult to connect with others um, just to simply breathe and and just be. So um, we have since 2011, Black nonbelievers has been very instrumental. In, in the United States as far as being um, a very, very vocal organization, uh, very openly representative of black atheists, humanists, agnostics, et cetera. And um, that is my story for now. <laughs> so I've got a two part question. The first part is, in its simplest terms, can you define what atheism is? Sure. So atheism, I define atheism as, you know, it, similar to the, the textbook definition. 
It is a lack of belief in, to me, God, spirit, supernatural beings, anything that has a divine premise. Uh, there is no, because there's no valid, because there's no evidence for that or for any of those things or any, any viable evidence, um, I have rejected those particular beliefs. I have, um, you know, I have come to my conclusion, an informed conclusion that those, those entities do not exist outside of, you know, the human mind and, and create in creations. And that's pretty much uh, for people who think that we, if we don't worship a God, we don't worship a devil. Let's just let's get that clear. Um, the same way we don't worship uh, Superman, Batman. I mean, sure, there are other fictional characters that we look up to and that many people can identify with, but you still know that they are just that. They're characters, they're fiction. The, the, the belief in God goes in that same category. So the influence of religion is deeply ingrained in most black people to the extent that they get triggered when confronted with certain words or concepts such as atheism. Mm -hmm. Why is there still such a taboo amongst black people to use to even use words such as atheist, agnostic, pagan or humanist? Yes, so I'm thinking of a conversation that I just had with someone who reached out to me and wanted to talk and was trying to impress upon me why they believed in God, why, what they defined God as. And it was as if somehow the atheist identity was just simply unacceptable, that even though they despise religion per se, that there has to be some sort of God or God-like entity that is guiding our lives. And most of it can be traced back to, you know, the, the times of colonialism, enslavement. Um, and, and we look at, uh, you know, Black people across the world, across the diaspora, and how this, in, and this has impacted our communities um, deeply. And much of it is rooted in not just trauma, but also how they had to overcome the atrocities that were, that were inflicted upon, upon our ancestors. Um, so for many of them, all they had was belief and when there was an opportunity to form their own churches at a time where white churches were not allowing black parishioners, um, black folks were able to take the church and make it something of their own. And um, there is such an emotional tie to that. There is such a, uh, there's a, there's a deep, deep, um, uh, there is, they, they, it, it is perceived as being a deep, so deep of a connection that it's so, it's so tied into our identity that it's almost hard to separate. So when you have folks who, and, and, there, and we've always been there, right? There have always been people who have rejected the concept of God, especially as it pertains to the enslavement and colonialism. Because one will always ask, can ask the question, how can you believe in the very same God that allowed us for our ancestors to be enslaved? Um, which, and which was justified, you know, by the same Bible. <laughs> and I think because, um, because of the role the church has played historically as being a place of gathering, being a place where you could find information, being a place that could where that where people could be um, gathered, um, there are so many people who put the the other uglier parts to the side, or it's that it's something that they just may not want to know, um, and so there is certainly the emotional tie to it that when there are those of us who question or even, or even ask those questions of why do you still believe? 
you know, there, there's a tendency to become defensive or to feel that, that vulnerability. And there are, there are some who've had such uh, traumatic experiences in their lives that that, is, that just seems to be the only way for them. And, you know, we, we try to understand it even though we don't agree with it. And sometimes it is even hard to understand. <laughs> but for our communities, because it is so ingrained into the culture, um, you know, into the politics, people know how to get to Black folks through the church and through, through church uh, communities and language. That to even question that, to even question the harm that it has done. And we certainly can see that we can point to very valid, um, you know, um, we can point to very, very valid um, times in history where we, where, we, where we see that it has caused so much harm. But um, again, a lot of people attribute their strong faith and belief to whatever they considered God to get them through. Of course, with the irony, <laughs> there's so much irony in that, but I think it is definitely more of the community that was built around this institution that is that makes it very, very hard for people to separate it. So in this age of pursuit of evidence, be it scientific or historical, uh, Black non-believers are routinely marginalized and stigmatized for their rejection of faith. Um, what is it about faith that bothers you as an atheist? Yes, so the slogan for our organization is walking by sight, not faith. And when we say faith, um, we definitely include blind faith because, and then of course, the definition of faith, even according to the Bible, is things that are hoped for and things unseen. Um, there has been enough advancement in, you know, in information, education, especially in Black communities for us to not have to rely on faith. But yet that is the central theme of, um, of many people's lives, of even when they know that they are going through something that is preventable, or that if they take another, if they, if they go an alternative route, you don't necessarily need faith because you, you can see that whether it works or not. And if, if it doesn't, then you, you try another route. And it's also interesting that many Black folks will question a lot of other things, but when it comes to their religion, it stops. <laughs> or many people, when it comes to their, their belief in God. And, and I also think back to one of my former teachers uh, one of my former mentors who was, she was an educator, very big on the racial justice aspect. I mean, the institutional racism, but when it came to her belief in God, oh, there, there was no questioning that. And faith tends to become a crutch for a number of people who they want to see certain things happen, but then they're also not seeing it. And, um, when that becomes the rally cry, you know, you hear it in so many of the songs, you know, there's a popular song in gospel music, we've come this far by faith. I don't know how many renditions have been done of it. And you still hear all of these people saying we walk by faith and not by sight. And while it is true that there are some things that our eyes can deceive us at times, but um, certainly uh, it, it implies that all you need to do is have faith in God and everything will be all right. But even in that same Bible, it says, say, faith without works is dead. You know, um, there, there are all these different things that are contradictory in the Bible. <laughs> but I do have a problem when there are clearly situations that you don't need faith for that you can actually deduce or come to a conclusion that something bad is going to happen, but, and you can do something about it, but because you have been indoctrinated to have faith because the people around you 
have been indoctrinated to rely on faith, oftentimes it can result in some very bad consequences. And often, and, and it has been blind faith that has led people to their deaths. It has been blind faith that has kept um, folks in such a sense of not just isolation, but in a bubble. And, and, and unfortunately that is a conditioning. And anything that seeks to rob you of your agency and the ability to question and think and to actually go against the grain and, um, and sometimes in fear of punishment and retribution, I definitely have a problem with. What do you say to the argument? And this is an argument that I hear uh, quite frequently that pre-religion Africans were never atheists. Well, that's interesting because all that takes in the, in this in this um, in this world and in this time of Google, <laughs> um, there have been you know some African uh, nations who you know, in their practices were, you know, they were very, very humanistic and, and atheistic. Um, and, you know, Africa is a huge continent. You know, there were certainly different beliefs that people had, um, but you can look to certain, and there is a name of a particular um, group or a particular uh, nation that was very atheistic. And, uh, but, but, you know, people will say, well, that's just, you know, you can't trust all of this information. You can't trust all you see on the internet, right? But you're supposed to just simply take, you're supposed to just simply trust your belief in God. <laughs> so it's almost, it's almost like a no one situation, but in this, I, that is very lazy thinking. And um, that often, you know, that often shows that there are people who are, you know, they see that is that is to me a level of anti-blackness to presume that all all Africans thought alike, our ancestors thought alike, that we did not have various cultural practices and customs and traditions, some of which probably were not rooted in a strong belief in the deity at all. So um, really, I would uh, I just always suggest people to do you know, to do their research on that is to you know, just look it up. And certainly, you know, it would be good for us to have that information on, you know, like, like ancient African people who, you know, who had, um, you know, who really didn't subscribe to a belief in God, but they certainly had practices that were more humanistic in nature. And that they realized that, you know, you just, you don't have to believe in a God in order to be good. And it's interesting that people do that with the Judeo-Christian religions. It's almost like saying that Africans were savages <laughs> in a way. And it's like, no, I mean, but then at the same time, it's like, just because you're an atheist does not mean you don't care about people, that you cannot build effective societies and institutions. It just simply means that you don't believe in, in, this, in this God. Certainly, certainly they were atheists towards the Judeo-Christian gods. For sure, just like many believers are atheists towards other gods. So that is a very, very, uh, it's a very interesting um, subject to take on, especially with many believers in Black communities as they try to tie in the history of, um, you know, of, of Africa and how it relates to us now. And um, there's such a romanticism of what it was like back then that there's almost a sense of denial as to um, whether or not there were ancient Africans who believed in God or not. I've seen you online do many shows uh, where you're engaging with theists. One in particular, you were with Matt Dillahunty. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think logic goes out the window when theists try to wrestle with a young earth creation concept where they clearly ignore dinosaurs, older civilization, historical artifacts. What is it 
in your experience when when engaging with this that this complete denial for all the evidence it is definitely th those folks tend to make an emotional argument it's an argument based out of emotion it's an argument based on their previous trauma and probably unre un not just unresolved but untreated trauma as well as perhaps some mental um, disorders or or mental uh, something in their you know um, you know something that they have not sought clinical help for so there is such a codependence on those beliefs and it has to be true because of either what they've been conditioned to believe what they may have thought they they saw and they're just standing firm on it no one or it's very very it, it can be very very hard sometimes to accept or to even even think about the fact that something that you were told by your parents which may not have been done maliciously they probably thought that they were doing the right thing um it's hard for people to come to terms with this perhaps not being true it can create such a psychosis and that depends on you know the sect of you know the the, the denomination of religion or the type of religion you were raised into um it can be devastating and it can be a shock and you know learning new information just on a regular basis can be pretty uh intense but when it comes to something that you hold near and dear um and and uh, and that you've grown up in a community of people who believed either the same or similar things it's it can be challenging and i've often noticed that um going back to the conversation that i had um with the person yesterday i could tell without even asking before that there was a traumatic component to this person's existence that they have experienced something so terrible in their lives that it only makes sense for them to rely on a belief in God or belief in some sort of divine entity. And then trying to put, you know, little scientific words here and there, you know, trying to say, well, you know, I've done research and providing no other backup. Um, you can, you, I could tell that they had been conditioned to doing something like this, to try to um, keep up their own faith, and also to try to challenge those of us who are firm in our positions because somehow we're wrong. But um, it's very, it is always very interesting to see the people who they're, 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 they're fine, they're wrestling with themselves for the most part. And there is a need for them to convince, try to convince us based on their own um, experiences and trauma. And you can understand it, but at times you almost feel sorry for them because it's like, wow, these are things that you really, really need clinical help for. But you know, you're just, you know, you're, you're fighting it. And so, and, and then of course the examples that they give can also can be explained with, uh, you know, medical terms and also, um, you know, and, and, and those, and not just scenarios, but, you know, there are clinical terms for what they're going through. Of course, you don't want to just call people crazy or anything like that, but, um, you know, it's it's never just simply nothing that hasn't been experienced before by many of us. Many of us have, have seen it. Um, we see the same things over and over again. And I know what I just try to do is to encourage people to continue to seek help for whatever it is they're going through. I do, I try to acknowledge any pain that they've been through. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you're still not making a credible argument for your God's existence. As a matter of fact, you're actually proving that he, she, or it really doesn't exist in any sort of tangible form.
Do you see religion as harmful to Black women? Oh, absolutely. I think there are now even religious people who agree with that. <laughs> you know, there are a lot now, a lot of Christians, and especially Black Christians, who can agree that Christianity has been extremely detrimental to Black women. Um, starting with, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, with colonialization, um, how, um, how the sexualization, how the, you know, how the coercion, how everything that is related to, you know, slavery, and that was justified by religion, has been, you know, Black women, our, and especially our ancestors, have had to bear the brunt of that. Um, expected to do all the work and to be subservient, um, but also at their at their own expense. And so it just it, it has absolutely been harmful to, to black women, no matter how much they try now to change it and bring women into leadership. Um, when the same principles and doctrines apply, it won't it, it really won't matter. <laughs> because it's it's now women doing the harm you know in in certain cases just like now when we see the you know when we see the black churches and we see all of these black religious folks it's like well you've almost kind of you've taken on the face of the oppressor so when that yes when when that tends to happen it's like yeah it, it has certainly done who a lot of harm to to black women in particular The very first video I done on the channel was about Martin Luther King and he wrote some essays on the pagan origins of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I wasn't expecting the huge backlash I got from the black community for simply discussing his views. Many of them didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Those that did, didn't want the information to come out mm -hmm. but he was very clear in his views on the origins on the pagan origins of christianity what are your thoughts on that i do a talk on dr king and how he was much more radical than people realized he was much more progressive than people realized because the he has been so anglicized to the man to being the man with it and also simplified to just being the man with the dream. And um, people want to just simply hold this view of him as some sort of, they're holding them to that godlike status to where he was a human being. He was actually a theologian through and through. And in order to go through seminary, you have to learn about other religions. You have to even, and, and it was also a lot of people don't know that he was actually preparing he was actually going to be a Unitarian Universalist minister as opposed to being a Baptist minister. Being a Baptist minister was better for him during the civil rights movement. You know, it was, it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was more feasible, but um, it's just, it's very, um, it's very sad and disappointing to see that, you know, that, that there are folks who are unwilling to learn more information, even about our leaders to know, especially someone like Dr. King, who, um, and who actually made a statement about how science and religion go hand in hand. Now, of course, we can take some issue with that, but he was very, very aware of um, what secularism was. He actually endorsed church and state separation. He was also, um, you know, he was a huge Star Trek fan, um, but there were so many things, there were so many important components to Dr. King that so many people don't know. And like you said, they don't wanna know because it challenges their view, but it's like, why would that be such a problem? Uh, you know, it's like, um, yeah. And I know he did a lot of writing in, in college. You know, he did a lot of, uh, explore, exploration of various religions. And, uh, you know, he was a very, he was very, very, I mean, he was very intelligent, very smart. I mean, he was, he started college when he was 15 years old. You cannot expect someone with that level of intelligence 
to not examine those beliefs and especially having such a level of education. So for people to reduce him down to that, it's actually like you are doing, you are doing a disservice to this man's legacy. You are actually, um, you know, just, you're really, and, and, and actually before he died, you know, he had, he was, he was facing so much backlash even with other religious leaders because he was really becoming more of a grassroots uh, person as far as getting involved with the Poor People's Campaign, getting involved with the strike in Memphis where people were actually suffering and they needed their voices to be heard. It was like, well, they just wanted him to stick to one script. And it's like, you just, you can't be, you can't do this type of work and expect no growth whatsoever. And what it really shows is that many of us who identify as atheists, humanists, and non-believers, we actually have more insight and more education into that than the believers do. And there's nothing wrong with not knowing, but not wanting to know <laughs> is where the problem is. On the channel, I'm trying to discuss more openly religious trauma syndrome. Uh, what advice do you have for people generally who are one scared to come out and say that they no longer believe, uh, especially from the the stigma that they're going to receive from friends and family? Uh, this is a real struggle for them to openly come out and and at least say, "I no longer believe." What advice do you have for them? Yes. So first, I just I absolutely it is important for people to know that they are not alone. There are many people who have been where you are and that coming out, per se, as an atheist is absolutely your choice. You can do that on your own terms, not because any atheist tells you that you should or that any believer or religious person in your family feels like you should have to hide it or, or try to dictate your identity. It is, a, it is a journey that should be based in um, sound reasoning, um, having a good understanding of what that identity is, and also knowing when you are ready to speak about it publicly and that our organizations and our, and our groups are not going to force you to be out um, at any given time. Now, I do tend to ask some people because there is, there's one person in the community who is very, very active on, you know, the YouTube, um, on the YouTube platforms in on, on atheist shows, but yet their, but yet their family members still don't know. Um, and it's like, well, it's only a matter of time for one. <laughs> And if these people don't pay your bills, if they are not responsible for your livelihood, you must ask yourself the question, what do you have to lose? Especially knowing that you have, that there is support out there for you. So there is a, there is sort of a challenge in a way, you know, because I, I firmly think that people should be able to live their lives unapologetically and openly. And, um, you know, the fear that people once had of leaving those communities behind and just falling flat on their faces, it's understandable, but it's not, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not reasonable because there are so many of us out here who can support. So um, it's very, very important that people come to that understanding that and, and the knowledge of that, because it is true that there are many more of us out here. We are here to support you in your journey. And when you decide that you are ready, um, just live your life as, as openly and as loudly as possible. Because, um, you know, once you get over, once you let go of that fear, then the people in your lives who try to, you know, when they try to emotionally tear you down, you know, that they, had, they, they no longer have power over you. You know, it can be, it is extremely liberating and empowering to one, examine those beliefs critically, 
come to a good understanding of where you are in your identity. And also um, connect with others who have been there and to continue to build a community around that and just um, stand, stand strong and firm with it. Uh, it's not the same for everyone. For some people, it takes years. Some people, it may take months. Some people, it takes days. And it's not a rat, it's not a rat race for you to try to you know, catch up with the other person or, or other people. Um, and that your journey is unique, um, even if it may be similar to others. And that's okay. Like it is, it is okay what you're feeling. It is okay what you're, you know, it is a, it, learning more and, and doing more for yourself as far as, especially for your identity, it, it is okay. Mandisa, thank you for joining us today. Thank you once again for having me.